Welcome to the smartest people in the room. We are glad you are here and just by showing up, you're already demonstrating your very own smarts. Today, I'm pleased to present two amazingly talented and outspoken music executives from north of the border. I promise you will leave today thinking, wow, who knew? And you'll also leave smarter and more inspired than you arrived. Before we get started, please let me take care of some business. First, to the audience, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat window. The reason we do these webinars is twofold. First, we wanna showcase really smart people and the amazing work they do day to day in the music industry. But the second reason is a bit more nuanced. Many of you know that I am a music industry headhunter. I run the music practice at Turnkey ZRG and I place music executives in roles throughout the industry. So by definition and function, I help people connect with companies. And in this series, my goal is to help you make more connections and I invite you to take full advantage of that opportunity. Specifically, I invite you to engage with the speakers and the other attendees in the chat of the Zoom. Please introduce yourselves, share your LinkedIn profile, say hello to your friends and make some new ones and ask questions of our speakers. We will try to address as many of those as possible during the episode. Also, please make sure your chat is set to address everyone, not just the host and speakers. I wanna thank our program sponsors for without their support, we could not keep this series free. Special thanks to First Horizon Bank, Turnkey ZRG, the Tennessee Entertainment Commission, MedJet, Tennessee Brew Works, Project Music, and better than booze. So let's get down to business. In today's host seat, we welcome Josie Dye. As one of Canada's most well-known radio and TV hosts, Josie has had countless conversations with the stars of the music world. You can listen to Josie on Indie 88 in Toronto as the host of her own morning show called The Josie Dye Show. Recently, she launched Cynthia and Josie's Unmentionables podcast. Cynthia and Josie's Unmentionables is about all those messy and sexy topics that we all have questions about but are afraid to ask. What constitutes cheating? How do I talk dirty? They share extremely personal stories along with their various guests. The podcast is one of, top, of the top podcasts in Canada. Previously on The Edge, Josie hosted the morning show and had a nationally syndicated top 20 music show that was co-hosted by mu a musical artist each week, including Foo Fighters and Soundgarden. As a TV host, Josie brought her down-to-earth humor in the Canadian homes. After co-hosting Oh So Cosmo for eight seasons, she then became the face of Canada's W Network. Welcome, Josie. It is such an honor to have you join us today. Thank you so much, Tom. That was great. And joining Josie as today's featured guest is Jake Gold. Jake is one of Canada's most successful artist managers and for its six season run, a judge on the national television Canadi hit Canadian Idol. In 1981, he started his own artist management company called The Management Trust, through which he is best known for his role in establishing and transforming the tragically hip into a national icon. In 2020, he reunited with the band to direct their legacy in Canadian music industry. And he also co-manages the quickly rising pop R&B act called Ethan Sermon, along with Ryan Hefford, acclaimed pop rock band, The Pursuit of Happiness, and the music producers Mo Berg, Lawrence Curry, and Russell Broom. Jake has been recognized by the annual Canadian Music Industry Awards as Manager of the Year in 1991, 93, and 94. In 2009, Jake was elected to the board of SEMA and has been vice chairman of SEMA for 10 years. In 2023, he was awarded the Change Award, formerly the Building Award, for his many years of service to the board. Jake was also board member for the Music Managers Forum, and was instrumental in starting the organization in the 90s. In 2013, he was the recipient of the MMF Honor Roll Award for his lifetime work in the field of artist management. He also sat on the Music Advisory Board of Ontario Creates for seven years. It is a pleasure to welcome these two Canadian rock stars to our platform today. Take it away, guys. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Wow, that was an amazing intro. And uh, it's nice. Sometimes it's fun to hear your bio <laughs> read back to you. <laughs> Tell me about it. I know. That was crazy. Hi, Jake. <laughs> I guess we don't need to ask any more questions, I know, right? We're done. No one cares. We're done. <laughs> I know. 
It's it's kind of funny, Josie, because I haven't seen you in ages. Like I hear you yeah. sometimes on the radio and we communicate, but I actually haven't seen you. And I guess this isn't really seeing you, but you know, I know. besides social media, this is closer th- to seeing you. Um, I guess we should just start, huh? Yeah. Do you like do you like my set? I feel like it might be a little too pink for this dialogue, but that's okay. I'm keeping it the way it is. I, I, I'm 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 fine with it. Pink is good. Pink is good. You so like it? What, what, what's the purpose of the set? Tell tell us. Okay. About the- well, so yes, I'll start. Even though everyone wants to hear about you, because you are a fascinating man. But I'll start by telling you. Um. Yeah. I. You know, like everyone, I started a podcast. Uh, this is actually my second podcast, but this one's doing quite well. It's called Cynthia and Josie's Unmentionables, and. Uh, as Tom said, it's just all about those things that you never want to talk about. We're getting down into the dirt and mm-hmm. we needed a backdrop with something that was like fancy. So I got this couch from Marketplace on Facebook, had someone come clean it to make sure there was no bed bugs. And um, then I got a painter to paint the wall. And now I'm just waiting for Cynthia and Josie's Unmentionables to go behind me. And then we've got, oh. we got a set. We got a set. We've got to get you some art for that set. I know I'm working on it. Well, you, this is like beginning steps, right? So yeah, but tell us about where you are because there's some significance about where you are right now. Well, I'm in my office and um, I guess um, uh, I guess the most significant is that anybody when, you know, we're making a, a documentary for Amazon Prime um, on the Tragically Hip. Um, I'm executive producing it. And uh, for the interviews that they did with me, um it was done right here so when the doc comes out a year from now um and people see the doc they'll be like i remember that i remember that set i think they they art directed it a bit i think they took awards of mine that were on a different shelf on the other side of the room and put some behind me because they <laughs> thought it would it would look better but um but basically yeah this is the set and i was i think i was wearing a black t-shirt in that one too so <laughs> of course you are you yeah. know, I Gotta feel like on brand, right? So yeah, obviously. And I feel like most people who are here um want to hear about you because and it's specifically me as a tragically hip diehard fan. And I know that, you know, that as um Tom said, this is his is his first Canadian one. And to any American who is listening who doesn't know who the tragically hip is, get on that. Um, but they are our everything here in Canada. They are everything. So, I mean, like, I know you're going to talk about it and I know, but like for, for me talking to you right now is like a childhood dream. (laughs) It's even though we know each other now, I, I, can I tell my story first, just about you? You don't know it. Okay. Go ahead. Let's hear it. Okay. You don't know it. So, uh, as I, I was 17, I was, on a road trip with my girlfriend, Kelly, we went down to Syracuse and the Tragically Hip was playing in a theater in Syracuse. Yeah. And someone said to me, like, this is before the days of text, I guess. Someone said, Jake Gould is the manager and he is a bulldog. But if you can find a way to, to say you know him, maybe you can get backstage. I used your name with security. They were so scared of your name. They let me in backstage in Syracuse where I don't know if you remember this show, but people were throwing things on the stage. Like it was a weird show. It was kind of, it was a weird one. And I actually got backstage and met the guys for the very first time using your name. (laughs) And, and, and well, that's good to know. Um, (laughs) Had I known I would have had you thrown out, but, um, but, but what's, what's interesting is we both love the tragically hip. I mean, I, I, uh found the band in 1986 mm-hmm. and i fell in love with them then and i continue to love their music and love them as people more importantly um and uh but you managed to have a a very close relationship um with the band and with gordon at, at some point um yeah. you started a relationship with him uh, uh a biz i wouldn't call it a business i would call it a friendship Mm -hmm. right yeah Yeah. and 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 we traded stories about that many times um but uh yeah so that's a great story it's funny because 
Liza Fromer, who you know, um, who used to host Breakfast Television here in Toronto, she has a somewhat similar story. When she was working at Q107, she was the promo girl. Mm -hmm. um, and she was 19. And and we the band was playing at the concert hall. And, you know, it was obviously sold. You couldn't get a ticket anywhere. And she said to her bosses, I really want to go to the show. Well, you're going to have to ask Jake Gold. And I don't know if you're going to be able to do that. And she called me and I was like, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll put you on the list. And and she went back and she says, I talked to him. He's, he put me in like I'm good. And none of them could believe it yeah. that she was able to get in. And her and I um, are still very good friends. We hang out. We go for dinners. And um, to this day. Uh, well, and that all started when she was like 19 and then, you know, many years ago. And this is something that you as a manager and listen, I'm married to a manager. We can talk about that eventually, but this is something that you as a manager, um, you have done that has stood out to me in media. So it's true. You have a reputation, at least when you were like at the beginning with the hip, when you've got this band that's climbing up the charts and they're becoming this huge, massive Canadian band, you have a reputation of like being a bit of a hard ass, but I think you understood how well the, like the media, what the media could do for you. I think that there was something, I think that my husband understands that as well. And I don't know what your technique is, but not all managers are like this. And I know this as somebody who works in radio, not all managers will open their doors for radio podcasters, TV personalities. Well, I think that it's it's um, it's a balance, right? Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that we were very, very conscious of was media could be our friend, but it could also be our enemy. And so we we were very particular about when we did things. So because we didn't want to use up, I would just call it all our poker chips. So if you noticed, we never actually did interviews when we launched a record right we we just let the reviewers talk about the record like what were we going to talk about something we did right mm -hmm. um so but we always did interviews when we toured so it was to, for us it was all about the show and creating an event around the show so mm -hmm. we would go into a market and we would talk to the local press and talk to the local radio about our shows and the show coming up because the album had already come out. Um, and then when we weren't touring or we weren't putting out a record, we did nothing. We turned down everything yeah. because we didn't want to be in the news every other day because at some point people are just going to get sick of you. So we were very particular about when we did media, how we did media. And, and in fact, when we were doing those radio interviews, when we were touring, I wouldn't let the guys especially in a lot of the markets where, you know, we're playing sort of in the downtown core and the stations were all in the, in the suburbs and sort of industrial parks. And you, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So we wouldn't go to the station. We would say, you know, bring your, your van down and we'll do the interview in the van, you know, outside of the venue. Mm -hmm. And because I wanted people to show up to the show and see all these media vans parked out front and all these cameras parked out front. So when they showed up, there was an event happening. Like they looked like it looked like they were at something really special because everyone was there. And that was part of the MO. It's like, no, no, we can't come to you, but you're more than welcome to come to us. So they all had their bands down there, all the radio, all the TV guys, they all were down there. And uh, it always created a scene around the shows. So that was all by design. How did you know, like at what moment, I'm obviously very fascinated with your career, so I'm probably going to ask you most of the questions and I'm sorry, but I just, I'm so fascinated. At what moment did you know, like that you had a band that was about to make it big? So it's, it, that's a, uh, uh, so as someone who has been in the business now for doing what I do for 42 years. Mm -hmm. um, the first time I saw them was in August of 1986 at a place called Larry's Hideaway. And the moment they walked on stage and Gord opened his mouth and he, you know, did his thing, I was like, holy shit. 
this is something I've never seen before. And, and I was like, we got to sign these guys tonight, turn to my partner. And so I knew then that this was something that I'd never seen before that was really special. And up until then, I thought, you know, where the bar was on what was great. And, mm -hmm. and at that point, I realized, oh, this is the bar. This is how great it has to be. And you have to have this feeling when you see something. And that's kind of how I, you know, when I work with new acts, I'm always looking for that feeling. I'm always looking for that moment where I go, okay, this is something that's going to move people because I saw how well it moved me. Um, and, and that night they were opening for a Rolling Stones cover band and they played all original music except for a couple of covers. And it was a uh, Larry's hideaway back then. A lot of the venues were seated venues. They were like cabaret style. We had little tables and, you know, it wasn't a, a stand up kind of mosh type vibe. And at the end of their set, all these, it was a packed house and they were there to see a Rolling Stones cover band. They all stood up and gave them a standing ovation. And I was like, yeah, okay. They just won over a crowd of people that nobody knew who they were yeah. and doing mostly original material and, and a couple of covers. But uh, I think it was then. And then, so I think that also informed how we marketed them um, and worked and and put them out to the public is we knew we had something great. Mm -hmm. So we never compromised. And that's why sometimes people would say I was a hard ass or I was tough to deal with is because we had a plan. And if it wasn't, if anything came towards us that wasn't part of the plan, we just said no. Right. And so we were breaking a lot of rules. It's like, why aren't you doing this? Because it's not part of the plan. Why aren't you doing this? Because it's not part of the plan. Like we never went on morning television. We never went on any television because we said, we don't want to be on TV. TV was not the place to see the band at that point in their career. We wanted people to come to the shows. You know, um, in the beginning, we never did all ages shows. It was also part of the plan to not play for kids because we wanted it to be a rite of passage because we were competing on uh, with music videos on much music. And the kid would see our video besides beside Madonna and R.E.M. and other rock bands of our ilk in that late, you know, late 80s time. And, you know, they were in a lot of cases a lot way bigger than us in terms of size of venues they were playing and we were still playing you know bigger clubs and places like that mm -hmm. and i didn't want a kid to see us in a club and go oh like and see rem in, in an arena so it was like no you can't get in so if a kid did get in you know using f fake id or something like that they weren't going to tell any of their friends it was shit no they were going to tell them it was amazing because they managed to get in so that was all by design Wow. So the first time we actually played a show, a big show, where underage kids could come in, under 19 could come in, was uh, on the Road Apples tour. And we did three nights at, um, like, our own show. We did three nights at Ontario Place Forum, and we did 21,000 tickets. A month after, we did three nights at the concert hall, which was 4,500 tickets in Toronto. And no one could understand how we sold 21,000 tickets in a month. And it was because we had frozen the kids out until that point. Mm -hmm. And uh, so all of that was by design. There's just so many questions. Like, I, I <laughs> so many questions. So I was saying I'm married to a manager. Um, yes, who's a very successful manager. Who is and a friend of mine, a mm -hmm. friend of mine, right? Um, one yeah. thing we, we need to talk about. Okay, so you're married to a manager. You spent time on radio and TV. Oh, you don't right? have to do it all. <laughs> I was like, okay. Hold on. Yeah, but... I, spent, I okay. spent time on TV. Yeah, no, that's what I was going to get to. Uh, but most people don't know is we're born a day apart. Uh, I'll be at 20 years, but remember I'm April 4th, you're April 5th. Like we've always had this kind of connection because we're both Aries and mm -hmm. you know what Aries think of Aries, right? So you always send me a text, happy birthday. I'm like, oh, that's so nice. How does he remember? I'm like, oh yeah, this is, this is the day before. Yeah. But 
Um, yeah. I'm married to a manager and I find that, and I think he's listening. He's on this somehow. I think he's on this. I find that uh, incredibly challenging, incredibly challenging. And I think it's because, and I don't know if you feel this way. And I know, you know, I don't know if you want to get into your personal life, but it's like he has his bands and then he has his personal relationship. Right. And it's very hard to distinguish between the two because um, often, and I hope none of his bands are on this and I should just take a look quickly, but often his bands he finds are sometimes like his children. Like, yeah, some I don't of- have children. Mm-hmm. I don't have children. I have two ex-wives. I have a great girlfriend. I have two ex-wives, no children. You have two children, which is a whole other thing of how you manage to do it all. But yeah. Uh, but, but as, and he's got kids. Yeah. So I get it. I get it. It is the hardest thing. He'll come home and, you know, he'll be upset about something that the kids have done. And then we'll get into like it deeper and I'll realize it's probably something one of his bands has done. And I think that he owns a record label. He's a manager. I think that that job has to be the most taxing job being a manager of a band. And I'm just wondering, like, what are some of the the challenging parts of being a manager, a successful manager? Well, uh, I think Joel, in some ways, we should say his name, Joel Carrier, right? Joel Carrier, you should say yes. his name. Yeah. Um, uh, I think Joel's probably done a better job of it than me, but he's managed to have a decent work-life balance. Um, for me, you know, um, I'm still working on that. I'm still trying to be have a, a, uh, in the times that I tried to have a work-life balance, I found personally that my work suffered. And and so I'm still trying to do that. I'm getting better at it. Um, But, you know, he's got, he's got you and he's got two kids. And I think maybe having someone in media probably helped um, with, with doing his job. I think that's, that's, uh, that's the thing. But I also, you know, I, I recently did this um, this thing for this guy where he interviews people and he gives you one question. You have 60, minutes, 60 seconds to answer the question and he posts posts all these different people's answers. And um, and he and he and he sent me the list of the potential questions and it was all about your job, your job, your job. And I wrote him back and I said, I don't have a job. And he didn't really understand what I was saying. And I said, I said, I have a career in artist management. Um, I don't really go to work. My work is wherever I am. Mm -hmm. And, and I think as a manager, that's what you have to do. You know, I've said it before where we don't really have dimmer switches managers. You know, we're not partially managing you know, we're either shut down, you know, sometimes I'll go to the cottage and I'll shut down for a week and I'll just won't, won't take any calls or anything, or I'm on, but I don't think there's a halfway point in being a manager. And I think that's kind of, and we're all self-employed people and we've all had to, you know, suffer through the years when there was no money. You know, I remember, you know, it took me 10 years to make 40 grand a year. Mm -hmm. And, um, and now I'm, you know, then it took me a couple more years to actually do really well, but it takes that long, yeah. you know, and it's, 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 it's the, that whole joke, the 10,000 hours thing, but, but it's true. Like you really have to, if you're going to play the long game, then you really have to have to think about it that way. So yeah, it's not easy, but I don't think of it as work. Right. Um, you know, it just is. You can't do it well if it's work. Right. No. And and I think we're both we're all really fortunate. I mean, you know, I, I did obviously some background on you, um, knowing less about you than I knew before. Uh, or now I know more. But, you know, like you went to what was then called Ryerson. So you chose to go into radio and television like that was a chosen thing. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're living your dream the same way. Like it's not, you know, um, having kids probably does affect 
you know, the idea of work versus non-work. But for me, since I don't have any, it's like, it's all the same to me. Um, but, um, you know, for me, I have a friend who's a drummer in a band and uh, used to be a drummer in a band. And in 1981, I just moved back from LA and he he approached me and said, you know, we want you to be our manager. And I was mm -hmm. like, I don't know anything about it. And he said, uh, don't worry, you'll be good. Why? Why will you be good? Why? I know why, but why do you think you're good? I, I have, you know what? I had, um, I had, people probably don't know this, but I had, uh, I used to sing in cover bands in high school and a little bit outside of high school. And then I'd gone on the road with a band for a little while doing lighting and, you know, looking after shit. And, um, and when I first came back from LA, my friend was in this other band and he basically had approached me to work with them as their lighting guy and road manager. And from seeing what, what I was doing with them, then the band split up. He then came to me and said, we're reforming as a different band and we've decided we want you to be the manager. And I guess he saw something in me that maybe I didn't see, um, but I was reminded by some other high school or actually public school friends of mine. Um, we were, we were, we were together playing cards and one of them said, you know, you've always been able to, to do what you always wanted to do. And I say, why do you say that? Cause in my mind, I sort of fell into it. A guy asked me to be his manager and I did it. And that was 81. And that's kind of all I've ever done since. But he says, you forgot in, in sixth grade, um, and he mentioned these three uh, girls' names that were in our class were, were were wanted to be in a talent contest, and you chose to rehearse them for two weeks, and they won the contest. And there they you said, go. they said, when you were eleven, you were managing a band. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so I guess it was always in me because I always wanted to be a part of it. You know, music yeah. was my whole life, so I always wanted to be a part of it, and I think. Um, uh, I, I ended up on this side of the business because I couldn't be on the other side of the business. So, it's, and it's also persistence and the need to win, I think, because that's what my husband is. It's like the persistence, the need to win and having an incredible year. Yeah. He's more saying. cutthroat. He's more cutthroat than me though. I've had conversations with him. He's more yeah. cutthroat than oh, me. Oh, we have a question by the way. Um, okay. Yeah. From Charles, he said, great band, meaning the tragically hip, smart manager, tremendous success in Canada. What's the thought on the struggles to break through in the U S well, I think breakthrough is a relative term. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think that, um, if everyone watches the documentary in a year from now, it will all become quite clear. Um, so I'm not going to give that much away, but, um, I think that the hips career in the U S would be a career if it was just alone in the U S that most bands would give their left arm for. Yeah. And I'll just leave it at that. I think too many Canadians are uh, obsessed with, you know, right. some sort of giant success. And I think the success as Gord Downey used to say to me, I want it on my own terms. Mm -hmm. And so the success was exactly what they wanted. And if anyone doesn't know, like, at the end, obviously, Gord passed and, uh, you know, he did his farewell tour, which we should talk about. But, um, you know, you had bands like Pearl Jam, Eddie Vedder, who is paying tribute to the Tragically Hip and how many American bands just loved the hip so much, you know? Well, they were a band's band. Mm -hmm. Midnight Oil and Los Lobos and, you know, um, we managed to actually make friends around the world. Uh, and I and I think that, but we also were never the kind of act that went around telling everybody everything. Right. It just wasn't who we were. Mm -hmm. You know, we we weren't. Although w there's some interesting stuff going on now. Um, there's um, I started noticing on our on our uh, DSPs, you know, the streaming sites, that Brazil was coming up as the number three market in the world, and I couldn't figure out why we'd never been there. And and then we discovered that they had used a head by a century in this television show opening credits called Anne with an E. 
and um, and the show was very popular in Brazil. And we were now seeing TikToks of people doing Ahead by a Century from Brazil. And if you go onto the YouTube page of the opening credits, most of the comments are in Portuguese. So we realized something's happening in Brazil. There's like this song is starting to take off. So we're now, uh, as of the last couple of days, we're now going to radio in Brazil with a head by a century as a new single. And the Brazilian universal team is behind it. And we're putting this whole marketing push behind the, the song in Brazil. So who knows? You You're know? going to be a nut like a Kate Bush all mm -hmm. over again for Brazil. Well, and, and there's another, uh, and then another big television show, another Netflix show that, is very popular around the world, just approached us last week to also license that song for the next season of, of that show, which I can't talk about yet because it's approved and they're doing it, but it's not for me to talk about. But that's also, that song is gonna be in another big um, international television show. So you never know, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes the, sometimes, I mean, that's the beauty of the music. It can travel without you, you yeah. know? Yeah, absolutely. Right? So, yeah. so I want to ask you a question though. Um, when did you know you wanted to be in radio and TV? Um, I wanted to be a singer. So it's like all of, both of us have this desire to be a musician, right? Like my, my, my husband probably does as well. And my kids as well. And my dad said to me, yeah, if you're going to be a singer, you'll do it outside of, you know, your career. So get a career and see how it goes. And uh, so, yeah, I went through for radio and television and university. Um, and then my last year of university, I was just basically producing a morning show. And that's how I, I, I just fell in love with radio. I fell in love with storytelling. Like that's what we're doing. We're just, we're just telling stories nonstop. And that's my favorite thing to do. I wake up every morning at, you know, 4.30, I go to work uh, and I just, talk on the air about things that have happened to me so it's kind of neat it's kind of a really 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 cool job and um also musicians too like retired musicians some retired mu have gotten into radio if you think about in Canada like Kim Mitchell and there's so many others um but it's I and mean, some I have gone the other way the guy that I deal with on a daily basis who's mm -hmm. the head marketing guy at Universal Canada that that deals with the hip he handles everything to do with the hips a guy named Ivor Hamilton I know who, Ivor, yes. for, of course you do who for yeah. years was on CFNY which was what the edge was called before it was the edge this is our like k-rock in in LA so that's where I kind of came from in Canada it's, it's the edge in fact at one point like the edge was the second biggest alternative rock radio station in North America after k-rock that's how right. big like the edge was when I was working on it back in the day. And uh, yeah, it's um, yeah, it's, it was think about how powerful radio used to be. I say used to, but at the same time, and I don't know if you feel this as well with your artists now, but they still say, even though there's so many like, streaming services um, that we still are introduced 30% of the audience to new music. So I mean, I don't know if that stat holds up, but that stat was recent. So I, I still feel like we have influence somewhere out there in one way or another. Like that, that you feel like you matter. I'm holding but, on. I'm holding on to something. But you know but, what? But, like, you're, but you're doing you're doing a podcast, which is interesting because your podcast, yeah. there's a camera on, right? Yeah. Well, and I'm from television and you were in TV, which we need to talk about. But yeah, I was I, I'm in TV and radio. So the podcast actually is a combo of both. Yeah. In a lot of ways where you're you're it's like a radio thing because you're interviewing and you're talking, telling stories, but there's a camera on you. And I think I, I, I wonder which do you like better? Do you like radio better or do you like TV better? Well, it depends on what kind of television. So the television I've done in the past, I did country music television. I did W Network, and then I'm sure if you if you know that magazine called Cosmopolitan, uh, in New York we had it was a New York company that did a TV show called Oh So Cosmo, and I was the host. Um, and that the three styles of television that I did, I would prefer radio only because for the most part it's teleprompter. For the most part, it's very structured. But when you're able to just tell a story and you're on radio and some television, when you're able to just tell a story and connect with people, 
That's what I love. But it's honestly nothing to do with a medium. It's nothing. And that's, I think, the problem with our industry. We get, and it's, this is for managers, it's for labels, it's for like every single aspect of the music industry is that we get so bent out of shape when it comes to the medium that we're on, that if we have a skill, it can be transferred into the, whatever is cutting edge, right? Right. And, right. and that's what I think people get so hung up on. They're like, oh my God, you're on radio, it's dying. Well, when it dies, I'll move over to whatever else the platform is that they're gonna wanna hear me entertain them in one way or another. Right. And you know, that, and that's, and that's the same with labels. Like it's the same with, I remember forever I said to my husband, oh, labels won't exist. They won't exist. Eventually they're gonna be gone. This is like before we got married and he was like, what? You know, what are you talking about? I'm like, there's no need for the middleman. Eventually there'll be like a one shop service, which, you know, obviously there is. Um, but you can never not need what my, I, I think what my husband's expertise is and what your expertise is. Like you will always need that, whether it's just called something different or it shapes into something different. Well, I well, I think, I think from, I still think you need marketing. There's, there's power and clout, mm -hmm. you know, I, um, Universal does a really good job for us on um, putting all the pieces together. Um, they have resources that, you know, we could probably hire out all those resources, but why bother? You know, we, right, have, a, we have a pretty good deal. You know, I think Kiera has a question. Yes, yes, do you want me to, I'm gonna ask it to you. Hi, Jake, I currently do artist management at my university with Mark Tavern. I've also done a &R with the same university record label. And I was wondering if you have any advice for college students like me who want to get into artist management or a &R after graduation. So I know Mark very well. In fact, I've offered to speak at the school. Um, so I'm still waiting for him to uh, put it together so I can actually, maybe we could do it over Zoom or something. I did that. Um, uh, Ethan, our artist, was at Berkeley for two years up until this year. Mm -hmm. And so I actually did a um, uh, a talk for his class uh, for Berkeley College of Music in Boston. And we did it just like this over Zoom. Um, you know, it's a really uh, interesting question because I, I've, I've got that asked to me before. A&R and artist management are two very different things. I think, um, I think you have to have a nose for talent if you want to be an A&R. Um, but I think um, being a manager, yes, you need a nose for talent, but you also um, need to really fall in love with the clients you're working with. Um, I think that it's really hard to be an artist manager if you don't love the music. And, and you also have to be willing to put in the hours because there are no, uh, there are no hours per se in what we do. Yeah, We work 24 seven if we have to work 24 seven and that's just the job. And you've gotta be willing to do that. So if you're willing to do that, go out and find a band and, uh, and then learn, learn on the job, which is what I did. I mean, you can go to these schools and they give you um, some good background stuff and they give you terminology and everything else, but there's nothing like um, actually being in the job and building relationships. You know, Tom, who's who's put this event on, um, him and I met at a conference in Aspen um, uh, this past year. And I'll be going back next year. And I've been going to this conference in Aspen since 1996. And I'm still meeting new people every year. And now my right hand guy Ryan, um, who who uh, who is you know looks after Ethan and some of the younger artists, Surrey Certain, a DJ that we work with. Um, I brought Ryan last year with me, so he's coming back again this year with me. So he can start to build those relationships, right? And I think um, a lot of people forget that our business is so much about relationships. Um, for that matter, every business is, and you have to think of it that way, and you have to build those and nurture those relationships. There's a guy on here, Larry Butler, who's in Nashville, who used to be at uh, uh, WIA or Warner, I guess, and um, I met him at the Aspen Conference back in the 90s, in the mid-90s, and and, and um, Tom says he'll be at Aspen again, it's good to know, <laughs> and, uh, uh, at Aspen Live. It used to be called the Aspen Artist Development Conference when a lot of record companies would be there because they had artist development departments. And that's what Larry used to, used to head up artist development uh, division. Um, 
but it they don't have those departments much anymore. So because they had literally they had because they were robust, they literally had departments dedicated to just helping bands promote their tours and marketing their tours because they knew touring could help sell the records. Yeah. But most labels don't have those departments anymore. Um, so now it's just called Aspen Live, and it really is a lot of people in the live music sector from uh, North America. Although I, uh, at this point, Ryan and I are one of the very few Canadians that go. Um, but that's where I met Bob Lapsets, um, who's a really popular writer and been on yeah. you know, been on his podcast a few times. Um, uh, so, and I met him, you know, we knew each other, but we never really talked and, and, uh, we've been friends ever since like 1996 because of you that. Know what? That is, I, I have to say, and I want you to continue to talk about that is the one thing that my husband, Joel, Joel Carrier does like you, the amount of people he knows, like it is, I cannot go to, I bet you any money, all these people who are here messaging, they all know him. Because you guys, that's what that's all you do is make connections. Like I can't even go to a concert without him talking to 85 people at the concert. And he's like, oh, but this guy's from Boots and Hearts and this guy's from here and we're going to start this together and we're going to do this. It is nonstop exhausting to be his wife. Well, and I <laughs> will say that is the one thing I will say of him looking out from the outside as a manager. That is the one thing he does better than anyone I have ever met is he is an incredible a connector and social like just he's very yeah. social yeah. that that's that's what we do and yeah. and the relationships don't always have to be about business you know mm -hmm. i have a friend and i won't say who it is but she's a very famous actor and um we have a what we have in common is we both love interior design and we both collect furniture and so we talk about this stuff all the time and she's going through a renovation and she was being screwed around by by the con her contractor and she had a big problem and she, she came to me and she says, I don't know what to do. And, and I said, I have the perfect person to help you fix this. And I put her together with a friend of mine who happens to be a writer and a director, but also is a project manager for a lot of these renovations and stuff like that. I said, you need to meet my friend. And they met and now her whole life has changed. Every the permits are in, the renovations all going smoothly because my friend's away shooting in another country. And she keeps writing me. She goes, I can't tell you how much how thankful I am that you made that introduction for me. Like my life has changed because of this person. So it it had nothing to do with business. It it wasn't there wasn't anything in it for me. You did it but to I, me. I, I did it what? You did it to me last week. Right. I'm I'm in the middle of of a, a job uh change <laughs> and i don't know where should say that and um you gave you me needed, you needed help with a particular <laughs> expert person of expertise and i said call this I got guy him. and i called him thank and? you and we and? we already talked <laughs> and we exactly. already talked it's it was perfect it was amazing so yeah that's like that that was huge for me and i guess that's the thing about managers is you have to know people. You have to be, you have to enjoy having those conversations with people. Broadcasters, most of us are incredibly shy. Most of us are awkward. We're like not talkers. We're actually the opposite of managers. That's why I think managers and broadcasters get along very well. We're complete opposites. So well, that's it, it, thing. It, 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 it's funny because, you know, back to the relationship thing, I think nurturing relationships is and it's something I talk to Ryan about all the time is you, you need to nurture relationships and it can't just be about business because if it's just mm -hmm. about business then you'll be found out mm -hmm. you know and sometimes you have to do things um you have to do things um because you want to not just because you have to Absolutely. and when you when you're when you're transparent and your 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 good deed comes from a good place, and it's not quid pro quo, and it's not keeping track. Um, I think it goes a much longer way than you know. You did this for me, so I'll do this for you. Sometimes you just do, but you know there are people in my, in our business that have um, um, have 
come to me for a lot of favors over the years, and they continue to come to me for favors. But when I've gone to them, when I needed something, they didn't deliver. And so, deliver. <laughs> so I remember that. And sure. I remember, I remember the takers versus the givers. Yeah. You know, and at some point you give up on the takers because yep. you're like, yeah, they're just takers. They don't actually give, you know? Oh. Um, so also a, uh, a little bookmark in the famous person. You're not going to tell us who that was. No, I can't. I can't Jake. because I don't think it, it would be right for me. It's a female friend of mine, but I, I don't think it'd be right for me for me to tell her personal business to disclose her anybody. life and her name. Yeah, just disclose her life. But anyways, we should um, also can we also talk about the fact that you were on Canadian Idol, which I guess is the Amer like I, if you've watched American Idol, you know all about it. And you were on Canadian Idol. And how did that happen? So, um, you know what? You know, Tom alluded to it in my bio. Um, you know, I managed the hip for the first 17 years uh, from 2000, from 1986 to 2003. Then we split. Um, and a couple of weeks later, I got a call if I wanted to audition for this television show. And at the time, I turned them down because um, I didn't think I could. I really wanted to do something like that. It was for Canadian Idol. And I... I remember coming home from the office and my my then wife said, well, you should do it. You'll be good. And I was like, OK, I'll go meet them. And uh, I went and met with these people and they said it was quite funny. They said, uh, do you want to hear some uh, some singers? And and I was like, OK. And they said, yeah, we have a little studio set up in the basement of the production office. So I was like, okay. And I sat behind a desk with two of the other producers and they have cameras set up and everything. Like it was a set they had set up and these singers were coming in to, they didn't tell me in advance that I was going to be doing this. And these singers came in and I had these notes and they said, you know, converse with them based on the notes and then, you know, do your thing. And I was like, okay. So I, carried on with them and you know Susie from Saskatoon and I was like oh where are you from in Saskatoon do you know this person this person and then I realized it dawned on me that they were actors pretending to be Susie from Saskatoon no yeah because they had hired musical theater people to come in and sing bad and sing good and you know so they could gauge my reaction like it would be on the television show um and I guess I did okay because they ended up casting me in the show. Yeah. Uh, and that was a that was a great experience. You know, it was a good stopgap because, you know, when I stopped working with the hip, it was like, okay, what am I gonna do now? I had some other acts, but it wasn't like I was, you know, rolling in it. So right. um, but it was a good lesson. Uh, I learned how to I learned a lot about the television industry. Mm -hmm. Um, I learned I uh, made new relationships. Um, with people that to this day I'm still doing doing stuff with. Um, and uh, I also learned when not to manage because I couldn't help myself. You know, I'd be on the set and think, oh, why are they doing it this way? Why aren't they doing it this way? And I remember one of the producers pulled me aside and he goes, hey, stop managing. <laughs> you know, I was right, right. I'm just the talent. Okay, I get it. There should be a was note, uh, like a... a poster on my front door to my husband that says when this door opens you stop managing that's what there right. should be right there it's like when you walk into this house you stop managing oh my well, god that's it, amazing i so so but it was interesting because um uh and no i was not the hard ass simon guy i was fair and honest but we had another guy there was four of us who was sort of the mean guy which was zach warner he he played right. that role. i per i personally was able to just be myself mm -hmm. and i remember at the beginning of when we first started doing the show i said look don't expect me to say anything to any contestant that i wouldn't say to my own clients mm -hmm. like i'm not putting on a show here i'm gonna be myself you you brought me in because I'm like the most experienced guy in the business here. I'm going to be the, let's call it the senatorial one. Yeah. That's going to come with the sage advice and the knowledge and the history and everything else. And I would, I would, 
you know, sometimes I would go in um, early and watch auditions from another room because they didn't want to intimidate the contestants. So I'd be in a room and watch them on a monitor. Um, and, uh, and then they would always have a question to start off the show and they would say, here's your question tonight. So I could have the answer. And I would be, I don't like that question. Ask me this instead, this would be more relevant. So sometimes I'd even be writing my own questions Wow! just because I felt I could offer more if I had the right question than the one they were giving me, you know? Wow. So, so I, 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 but I learned a lot about how it runs and how everything works. And it was a nice little vacay. I got to tell you, um, you know, I sit in my office and when we were live, you know, I'd have to show up at 530 and I'd be looking at my watch all the time. Like, is it 530 yet? Because I'd go there and someone would park my car and then they would take my clothes for the night from me and, you know, walk you in. And there's like, do you like, would you like anything to eat? And would you, would you like a drink? And someone was pressing my clothes and then you'd go into makeup and it's like, oh, this is what it's like to be the talent. Oh, I don't have to do anything. Right? Okay. And well, wait, wait, so wait, I, wait, wait. Hold up there for a second. First of all, you are on, you are, okay, so yeah, maybe if you're on a television show like Canadian Idol, I get that. Although in my radio world, there's none of that happening at all. But yeah, yeah when you're when you're working with a prime minister's son, which uh, obviously Ben Mulroney was in the show too, right? Then maybe yeah. that maybe if they did it for Ben, they have to do it for you. So. No, no, they 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 did it for all of us. I mean, the show yeah. had a big budget. We were we were the we were you know basically to this day still the biggest tele yeah. rated, rated television show ever in the history of Canada. You know, yeah. for the, for the run that we did. Um, so you know we had a big budget. Yeah. And our budget included, you know, like we stayed in suites and, you know, we flew up front on airplanes and, you know, and, and sometimes it was a little over the top, like, you know, they would have cars pick us up at the airports when we would land in a city and we were doing auditions and we were all on the same flight together and they'd have four cars show up and we'd be like, you don't need to do that. Like you can send one car, send a van. We don't care. Yeah. Right. Like we're fine. Like, you know, because sometimes we would ask for other stuff and they would say, oh, it's not in the budget. And we'd be like, well, send one car instead of four. Maybe you'll have some money in the budget. They hated when we said stuff like that. To them. <laughs> the, the three, three of the four of us were managers. Right. Zach so you could, manager, you, you, Carly was a manager. Yeah. Right. So, That's, you know, that, that was doesn't us. happen. None of that happens anymore. Now that there's streaming services. It's like we don't get any of that extra money, although maybe in the States and the American Idols they do. But uh, yeah, not anymore. Well, it, Tom, you know, you asked about what's Canadian Idol bigger than Hockey Night. Interestingly enough, <laughs> our first show when it premiered, it went up against Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Finals. And they did 2.4 million and we did 2.7 million. How do you remember that? Our premiere show, because you don't forget when you beat Hockey Night in Canada, Game 7 of the Stanley yeah. Cup Finals. You don't forget that. You don't forget. Wow. Well, listen, the other thing is I don't forget a lot. There's a lot of stats in my head and a lot of things in my head. It's just one of my things. I have friends that will – I have a good friend, Ruben Fogel in Montreal, that – bugs me all the time he goes yes you're gonna tell me what i wore that night like it's just a thing that i have that i remember shit so good for you good you for know you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah even with all the hash i smoked through the 90s so <laughs> wow when it was when it was illegal and now it's legal and i don't do it anymore it's like i kind of got it all mixed up isn't that know? funny how canada works it's like as soon as something becomes legal we're like oh wait P i don't even smell i don't smell weed anywhere around here anymore i used to before it was legal and now that you don't smell it at all yeah, yeah. i know it's pretty know. funny um so so you grew up in pickering yeah <laughs> so for people that don't know pickering's like a suburb of toronto yeah. right yeah. So was it your goal always to come to the big smoke? I mean, not really. I feel like my goal was probably to like make it big in America. And then, you know, you have kids and stuff happens. And um, Joel, my husband, he was living in LA for half the year for a long time. And I, w I was in Toronto once we had kids. And yeah, I guess now it's kind of like you just want to make it, you just want to, you want to have the best, you want to enjoy what you're doing and kind of keep climbing, but you, you understand that there's always going to be a limit, right? Like you, you know where that like ceiling is 
Um, maybe one day when the kids are out of the house, the ceiling will get higher and higher and hopefully it will. But I mean, I feel like I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty well right now. I've uh, listen. Yeah. You're you're employed in the in the media business, which I think is a is a testament in itself. Joel still managing acts that are yeah. selling out big venues. Yeah, so Joel's he, Joel's. He, I'm, he, I know. He, I feel he, like I'm talking more about him, but he, he. But it's because like the relationship that we have is so important. And I know a lot, there's a lot of people in here in the industry, but yeah, Joel has still has like, is still in the States most of the time, I'd say. Like yeah. I'd say a lot of the, he's in Kansas tomorrow. Um, is, he, is he there with Alexis on fire or is he there with uh, um, Dallas? City, City in color. Yeah. City in yeah. color tomorrow. And it, he, he, yeah. So if anyone doesn't know, he also part manages well, City in color when City in color does his uh, stuff with pink Alicia. So it's like, there's a lot of traveling. So you, right. somebody has to be the one that, you know, with the two of us, it's kind of like you have your time, then I have my time, then you have your time, you know? But you guys also have a cottage and you yeah. spend enough time on the lake. And that's a thing that we do here in Canada yeah. is we yeah. go to the lake. You know, I started renting a place in 2009 on Stony Lake and I, I go there every year. Um, my, my, length of time has been growing because now that we can do so much of what we do remotely, I, uh, I, uh, I, I can do work from there. So like last year I did four weeks up there in the summer. Amazing. This year I only did three because I gave one of my weeks to a good friend who was there before me and she really needed another week up there. And I said, just take my week. And, um, from the same we're renting well you know scott you know his place right on mm -hmm. stony mm -hmm. yep. so yep. so a lot of people in the industry have been up there and so it's just a great place to go and i can work from there he's he's got internet and as long as you got internet you can do anything so um yes. but, but you get that work-life balance right in your summers absolutely absolutely so yeah like there's still i mean even just doing a morning show like you have so much time during the day other than unless you're like me and trying to do a, a podcast as well. But um, yeah, like you, you do, you're able to kind of keep it a little balanced, at least in this stage of my career, which is right. Great. Is, is there any more questions uh, that we have done, here? Man. Yeah, we're almost I hope done. You're, I hope we were, I mean, you're very interesting, Jake. <laughs> you, you know what? We should just wrap up. Oh, there's Tom. Hi, Tom. I'm not yeah. coming in to stop this. I'm no, just no, no, it's all good. This has been fascinating, and I knew it was going to be. Um, I want to hear a little bit more about Josie, though. Uh, Josie, tell us a little bit more about this podcast, and what's you're going into your second season. Is that what I'm understanding? Yeah, so uh, next, actually, October 3rd is when we start our season two. It's called Cynthia and Josie's Unmentionables. It's uh, in Canada. We've, we're a top 10 in, on Apple most every week. Um, but in the States, we have not advertised in America yet. So Apple was thinking of, of doing a little advertising this season in the States. So if you, if anyone can watch it, it's called Cynthia and Josie's Unmentionables. It's pretty but juicy. You should, you should give some background on Cynthia because she's kind of the, the, the sex columnist, right? She writes so, for newspapers and she does television shows and stuff like that, right? Basically, she is on the like, the view in the States. She's on the Canadian version of the view up here, which is called the social. And uh, her name's Cynthia Loist. And yeah, she's a huge TV personality here in Canada. Um, actually, we have an episode. I haven't told you about this, Jake. I haven't told you. Okay. <laughs> we have an episode called Gord wrote a song about me. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna put that out maybe October 17th um yeah oh okay so just so everyone knows who doesn't know October 17th is the day that Gord Downey passed away mm -hmm. so it's yeah. it's a very it's 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 like a, a, a um it's kind of like a holiday here but it's not a holiday it's not an official holiday but, it's but kinda that's like it is kind of like it it's the the whole city and I wish the I could country. describe this. The whole, the whole country. The whole yeah. country stopped when when the Tragically Hip did their last tour. You and I were together in Kingston. The yeah. whole country stopped. And I have never in my life seen anything like this 
ever. I basically would drive down the street. Like I get emotional talking about it. And there were Canadian flags. This is not a Canadian thing. We don't do this. Their flags were hung outside every single window in every single house. And it was like, it didn't matter the politics. It didn't matter if people were into pop music. It didn't matter what it was about. The entire country stopped when Gord played and the hit played their last show in Kingston. And it was like nothing you could ever imagine. It yeah, I mean, there was there was 11 million people that they know watched it on TV, but that didn't take into account that every town across the country had their town squares with mm -hmm. screens up. And there was 20,000 people in every little town square watching it together as if they were watching a concert. And so, and there was another million people that streamed it around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, um, just, and that was the night that Eddie Better did a shout out to them from Soldier Field. They were doing their show mm -hmm. and did a shout out during their show about the fact that the hip were doing their final show. And Dan Aykroyd uh, yeah. and all ever it was unbelievable. It really was. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's all gonna be in the dock. So yeah. <laughs> the dock is really deep. The dock is really deep. It goes back like right to when you know Rob Baker and Gord St. Clair uh grew up across the street from each other and knew each other from the time one of the guys was three and the other guy was a year and a half. So it starts mm -hmm. then when they were like literally you know, one one of them moved in across the street from the other when they were that age. And it's that's when the doc starts and it's chronological. So we're just doing the rough cuts now on episode four and we're almost finished three and uh, it's going to be four parts. And it's slated to come out in uh, literally a year from now. Will it be going into theaters or going straight to streaming or both? Um, I think our plan is to hopefully premiere it at the Toronto International Film Festival, which is happening right now in Toronto, and then do like a one-time thing and then go right on to Amazon from there around the world. So, but it's a big priority for Amazon. You know, I made the deal with the the people in the U.S. and they want it. They wanted it for the world. The thing about Amazon is they probably know every single person in the world that's ever clicked on anything to do with the tragically hit. You know, so when you're working with someone like that, they have the ability to market to everyone. So yeah. it's a good place to be. You know. Yeah. Well, guys, listen, we are out of time, but I just want to say thank you, Jake. You. Uh... You're not the greatest manager in the in the country for any accident. You knew exactly what you were doing with the hip. You were a genius in the way you managed that career and turned them into the biggest band in Canada ever. Josie, what an honor to have you. I'm so excited about the next chapter for you. Uh, you ignored my question in the I chat. Did. About your... <laughs> I did. <laughs> well, on purpose. <laughs> I look, we look forward to hearing more about that. But to the audience, you got yourself a real treat today, and I knew you would. Thank you to you both. Jake, I'll see you in Aspen. And meanwhile, everybody be nice to each other. Good, good. That's good advice, Tom. Thanks for having us. Josie, nice to see you. Maybe I'll see you in person one day soon. Hopefully. Yeah. Bye, Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Tom.